Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very last section, the nervous system. Um, so in this video uh, section, we are going to be focusing on the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Now, um, uh, just a quick heads up for those uh, who are uh, uh, watching this. With the exam that you'll be taking, normally I used models for the spinal cord. Um, however, um, it was uh, over the weekend, uh, my, my father-in-law had to go to the emergency room. He had a fever, etc., and passed out. And um, so then, of course, uh, we, uh, we were around him with that. And um, we had to wait for his COVID results to come back. And he is negative, so fortunately, I was not around a COVID person. But until I found out, I had to self-quarantine. And uh, I was not actually able to get on campus um, to, to get those models. So, um, but, uh, so I will be using diagrams uh, for this section uh, specifically. Um, so as we go through this, just be aware of that. I will be mentioning. Now, uh, as we go through this, uh, we're going to be starting off with our nervous system. And there are three major functions of the nervous system. And I want to start off with what it does. So let's get into and talk about our nervous system a little bit. And with the nervous system, you can see some of my lovely, lovely scribblings there. I thought I had that pre-prepped already, but I didn't. Okay. With our nervous system, I'm going to be discussing some things that our nervous system does. Now, one of the things we want to discuss is our nervous system is necessary to take information in, make sense of it. I don't know why it's not going to focus for me. Come on. It's just being... Uh... There we go. Okay, so our nervous system, uh, when we look at the human nervous system, what we're going to see is that it has some major functionalities, and uh, but also some anatomical subdivisions. So I do want to talk about the anatomical subdivisions first, and of that, uh, let's start with our brain. and our spinal cord so we'll have that brain and spinal cord and i'll be talking about what this is and what they com combine to make in a moment but as we start with the brain and spinal cord let's say i have an eyeball here and let's say this eyeball uh is looking out our eye is looking out at the world around us we are seeing some individuals around us and some light some information about that person is coming to that eye well that eyeball here we have to be able to get information about that eyeball and send that information to the brain so the brain can understand what's going on so we have sensory input arriving to the brain now the brain has to be able to take that information make sense out of that information and hopefully potentially try to do something about it and let's say that we have some processing or integration then that uh, the brain and the nervous system has to make a decision that maybe we're going to use some information here. We're going to send out a control maybe to some muscle fibers in our body. And we're going to go, let's say we looking across the crowded uh, lunchroom area or something. And you see someone who's very attractive and you're thinking, I might want to go out with them. I might want to ask them out on a date. So that you're going to tell this muscle you need to contract to walk over towards them so you can ask them out on a date. So our nervous system has these three kind of intertwined um, functions where the reset they receive sensory information they integrate that information and then they produce a motor command so there is sensory information coming in then there will be the integration of that information we have to integrate it Then we produce motor commands, and that is concerned 
about that information. So maybe, like I said, you see somebody beautiful across the room. Your brain goes, well, they're very attractive. I'd like to go ask them on a date. Then you send information to your muscles to go walk over to them. And maybe speech center is going to say, hey, can I, uh, can I take you out for coffee? You ask them out on a date. So uh, this is what's going on there. Now, to do these things, we have two anatomical divisions, a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. So let's talk about that. The central nervous system, we're going to call the CNS. This is brain and the spinal cord. And brain and spinal cord make the CNS. The central nervous system is found at the center of the body. It's centralized. Then we have these uh, red and purple things. And uh, so I'm just going to use purple here. And then I'm going to write to the side of this. This is the PNS or peripheral nervous system. That is everything outside of the central nervous system. If it's not the brain and spinal cord, then it's peripheral nervous system. These are the things that receive information, send information out. So what we will see is um, that our brain is kept pretty isolated. And the first thing I want to talk about is an anatomical set of membranes that surround the brain called the meninges. Now, what I'm going to do to make this simple first, and then I'm going to go in and talk about it and show you some diagrams, and we're going to talk about the brain and spinal cord. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some colors in case you guys like to use the same colors. I'm going to have uh, green, red, and purple. And I'm going to have our CNS, our entire CNS here. Now, to draw it this time, I'm just going to simplify it. And I'm going to take, this is our brain. This is our spinal cord. And um, so I have brain and I have spinal cord. And the CNS will have what is called meninges around them. There will be meninges. Now, we're going to start on the inside and go out in this drawing. Now, on the inside, there will be one. Now, it's very difficult for me to do that on a drawing um, because uh, it's hard to be that close and you be able to see it. But uh, sometimes I try to get a little closer and closer if I can. Is In reality, it is fused with the tissue. It is right on it. Um, one of the, uh, um, this will be our innermost layer, innermost layer. And we're going to call this the Pia Mater. Then let's use red and we'll come into here and we'll wrap around that, leaving some space here. And wrap around this one here. And this will be the arachnoid. Mater means spider mother. Pia mater means tender mother. Then there's going to be on the outside of this our tough mother, the dura mater. And that's our tough mother. So there are these three layers of meninges. Now, I'm going to go in and talk about these in some detail now. And what I want to do is, is we're going to start with our dura. It is our tough mother. Dura mater means tough mother. It's durable. It's tough. It's white. It's dense. It's fibrous. It's the outermost layer. It's this connective tissue layer. Now, there are actually two layers. There's part of it that attaches to the skull called the periosteal layer. It attaches to the periosteum, so the fibers of the uh, outer fibrous layer of the periosteum of bone becomes integrated into the periosteal layer. Then there is the inner layer, the one that faces inside, facing the uh, arachnoid mater, called the meningeal layer. And then under that will be a subdural space. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to use black, and I'm going to go in here and write subdural space. So, like if somebody has a subdural hematoma, then we know where that will be happening. 
Then we have our arachnoid mother, I mean, arachnoid mater, uh, the spider mother. It's called that because the arachnoid trabeculae of it look like spider webs. So there is an arachnoid membrane, this epithelial layer, and then the arachnoid trabeculae are these collagen and elastic fibers that are stretchy that form kind of what looks like a uh, spider web. And underneath the arachnoid layer is a subarachnoid space, and that contains cerebrospinal fluid. So let's go here and label subarachnoid space, and let's write that there is CSF found here. CSF is found in the subarachnoid space. Now, what we also will see is this is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates in there, bathing and floating the brain inside. Now, on top, on the neural tissue, directly on it, it's this very meshy, uh, delicate connective tissues, elastic fibers, yellow fibers, collagen fibers, white fibers. And they are surrounding your brain. They actually surround the blood vessels. They actually bound to the neural tissues. And that's the pia mater. So there is no subpeal space. Now, when we think about this from the outside in, outside in, it's DAP. Outside in, it's DAP. D A P. You DAP it on. Now, inside out, it's PAD. You might have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you live inside of a bachelor pad. So that's some inside out. You dap something on the outside. Okay, so let's uh, move on now. So uh, you could see the arachnoid trabeculae here, and you can begin to see what looks like spider webs and things like that. You can begin to see the different spaces. Um, you could see the subarachnoid, uh, uh, subarachnoid space with the arachnoid trabeculae. Uh, then we can actually see the arachnoid mater, uh, subdural space, the dura. Uh, and then here's a blood vessel. Uh, this is your superior sagittal sinus. Um, so as we go through this, you can also see it here a little bit less detailed. They're also showing arachnoid granulations. There's a little bit extra detail there. Now, as we also see is the brain and spinal cord have these both. You can see here the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. Um, as it's associated to a gross anatomy of a spinal cord here, we have a cadaver dissection of a spinal cord opened up uh, as well. And you're looking at the front. So this would be having removed the vertebral bodies, uh, looking at the front. Now, what we want to look at next is our spinal cord. Now, one of the things I'm going to do here with the spinal cord is we're going to talk about each of these kind of levels. And I'm going to talk about, uh, with spinal cord, the main anatomy, we'll talk about the cervical enlargement, the lumbar enlargement, the conus medullaris, the cauda equina, and phantom terminale. What I want you guys to do first off is while we're drawing the spinal cord's anatomy, what I want us to do is we're going to start off by just taking that like this, and then we're going to bulge here. Then we'll draw down a little bit more, and then we're going to bulge again. And then a little bit more, and then we'll taper it off like that. And then down the middle, I'm going to draw a line just down the middle here, and then keep going down that way. Now, from this side here, we just want to draw these little wisps like that. We'll do three on each side. Okay. So this kind of looks like a rat that we're looking at from the top and that we've kind of flattened out. So this is our spinal cord. I'm just drawing the gross anatomy to help us understand some of the big stuff that we want to help you guys learn. First thing is our cervical enlargement. This is where the nerves of the upper extremities come out of upper limb. Uh, so they come out, their nerve, uh, the nerve cell bodies, the neuron cell bodies, are crammed in here. And that's actually why there's enlargements. It makes extra room for multipolar neuron cell bodies. Now, what I want you guys to see is it starts at C4 to T1. C4 to T1. So what we're going to do 
is we're going to call this cervical enlargement here. And then brackets on here, C4, sorry, I'm C4 to T1. And we'll put brackets on that. Cervical enlargement from C4 to T1. Now, the next enlargement where the lower limb nerves come out of starts at T9 to T12 vertebral level. And this is your lumbar enlargement. And the lumbar enlargement, as we said, t, uh, we go from T9 to T12 vertebral level. So T9 to T12. And you're like, Mr. Leverd, why is it called lumbar when it's squarely in the thoracic region? The lower nerves emerge from that. Then we're going to see our conus medullaris. And it's between L1 and L2. It's this conical tapered end. So L1 to L2. So I'm going to put a bracket L1 to L2 and label the conus medullaris. And then what we want to do is take a look at our cauda equina. These are the spinal nerves that come off of the end and they go down into the vertebral canal and they make what looks like a horse's tail, uh, hence cauda, tail, equina, horse. So these are part of the cauda equina, the cauda equina. And then lastly, we have our phylum terminale. And it goes from the conus medullaris and it stops at S2 vertebral level. S2, so it's attached to the sacrum. S2 vertebral level. So we're going to go from conus medullaris down to S2 vertebral level. And that is the phylum terminale or the terminal filament terminal fiber it's a pia mater string that helps to stabilize the spinal cord now to see this diagrammatically and i will have to use diagrams on the test let's zoom in where we can see our cervical enlargement here moving down we have the lumbar enlargement or also called lumbosacral enlargement um, and I've kind of want to, uh, up, uh, I think our notes need to update that. I'm going to call it both, called the lumbosacral enlargement, then our conus medullaris, and then after that we have all, a lot of this, as you're going to see, is actually the cauda equina coming down. So this is why it ends right here in the thoracic area. But these uh, go all the way down, then the phylum terminale kind of comes down all the way down and ends at S2 is the phylum terminale. And uh, <clears throat> so what you'll see is with it is your uh, phylum terminale at the very end. Now, next we want to talk about it in cross section. Now, this is where you guys' replacement points come into play. Okay, this is what you will do for your extra points, your five points that I'm allowed to give, um, is the spinal cord cross-section drawing. Now, when you do this, uh, real quick, uh, let me log into our D2L page and show you guys what you're going to do. Now, on this, uh, when you go into D2L uh, 2010 I-55, uh, and you go into assignments, um, Mr. Lefford is now has to build that is the spinal cord drawing and um, what you need to do is upload a diagram upload an image of your own spinal cord cross-section drawing into this folder any digital format is accepted so as long as you give me a picture in digital you can draw it on a piece of paper and take a picture with your smartphone and upload it directly from your smartphone 
Now, uh, this will open up when you guys do your lab final. And it will go into the grade book under replacement points. So I just want to make sure you guys knew that was there. This is what I'm doing for your replacement points. So the spinal cord cross section. So whenever you draw it and you're happy with it, uh, what I would recommend is just go ahead and take a picture of it. You can, uh, I've had students in the past do some of these drawings like this where they did it like I have a tablet that has a whiteboard and I can get on that and use like a stylus and draw my whiteboard and then just screenshot it and upload it. Um, you can draw it on a piece of paper, snapshot it with your phone. Uh, heck, if you want to draw it in Microsoft Paint, as long as you put a picture of that up, you're good. So what we're going to do to draw this, we're going to draw something like this first. And first thing I want to do is we're going to draw the kind of back first. And we're going to do this, and then we'll come around the front. And some of my former students said that this kind of looks like Santa Claus bending over and mooning you. And <laughs> so, uh, so that's what some of my students in the past have said that my my spinal cord drawing looks like Santa Claus mooning somebody, and maybe he sat in some figgy pudding and. Uh, um, so, and he's got that all over himself, and he's bending over to Moon Yu, and he's sat in the milk and cookies. Now, on one side, we're going to come over here, and I'm going to draw only on one side this, and the other side, I'm going to leave it uh, for simplicity. And uh, I do have my reasons. It's just that, uh, like I said, simplicity. So we're going to draw something that looks kind of like this, okay? This side also has these, but I'm only drawing one side. Now, what we're going to do is on each of these, so you can pause if you want to complete this drawing, but I'm going to move on, and we're going to start with gray matter, and then we'll do white matter. So let's label those first two. First thing we want to do is go inside, and I'm just going to write somewhere here. Let's say I'm going to write it right here, gray matter. Not matter, gray matter. And then over here, let's just write white matter. In the spinal cord, white matter is external and gray matter is internal. This will be opposite when it comes to the um, uh, brain. Now, um, the gray matter. What is important about this is first thing is it's neuroglia and cell bodies. There are axons, but if there are axons present in gray matter, they are unmyelinated. Now, it's mostly neuroglia and neuron cell bodies, and if there are any axons present, they are non-myelinated axons. Now, the color of this comes from the fact that neuron cell bodies contain a organelle, an organelle called nissel bodies, that is the endoplasmic reticulum, that is where actually most neurotransmitters are produced, uh, and it gives the gray matter its name, that's why it gets color. White matter is myelinated axons, that gives it its white color because myelin is very lipidy rich now there is two things i also want to label the anterior median fissure and the posterior median sulcus now anterior median fissure fissures are elongated clefts or slits anterior on the front anterior median in the middle fissure a deep cleft groove or slit and back here, we have a more shallow impression on the back side, the posterior, posterior median in the middle, sulcus, a shallow depression. Posterior median, sulcus. Now, it's on the back side. Now, connecting the gray matter together, and to draw this, what I usually just do is we know this is gray matter, 
and I'm going to do like a bridge and this uh, what we have is on both sides here this is called the gray commissure you can probably start over here and it will look better than what I did. Uh, the gray commissure. And the gray commissures are the bridge. Commissural fibers are neurons that run side by side. So we refer to them as commissural. So the gray commissures. Now there's also white commissures. And this is our primary white commissure. Commissure. All right, now let's look at, uh, so here when I said that, when I drew my spinal cord, I said that it looked like we had uh, Santa Claus bent over, mooning us. Well, his, his little um, backside here, his little backside hole, uh, this is the central canal. Now, the central canal also contains cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, central canal, okay? It is a hollow area. Now, the reason why it's hollow is development. If you guys have had general biology too, uh, then you would know that uh, it's there because the uh, uh, swellings of the neural tube um, form our central nervous system. Now, uh, we also, our central canal, in the gray commissure, there is a hole, and it contains CSF. Now, there will be three horns. Now, two of them are just not anything we need to worry too much about. Um, we will talk about them more in detail in lectures. So, what I want to do is label the posterior, the posterior gray horn. The lateral gray horn and the anterior gray horn. Now, the only thing really that I want to talk about with any kind of meaning right now, uh, but in lectures, you guys will talk more in detail about these, is that the lateral gray horn is in between the posterior and anterior but it is found only in the thoracic and lumbar parts of the spinal cord, as those are going to be where the autonomic nervous system's uh, neurons uh, that are sympathetic are going to arise. Now, there is also three white columns, an anterior, posterior, and lateral white column. Now, we can do the anterior white column here. I'm just going to dot it in. Anterior white column, lateral white column, and posterior white column. Okay, so those columns are located some places. Number one, the lateral white column is between uh, the anterior and posterior white columns. The posterior white column is in the back side between uh, the posterior median sulcus on each side. And uh, the anterior white column is actually found basically uh, between the anterior median fissure and the anterior white column. So it forms these, I mean the anterior gray horn, sorry. And it forms these kind of bundles. And basically these are where the myelinated neurons are heavily. Now they are on the other side of my drawing as well. So I'm only drawing it on one side, so they are also on the other side. But I needed to say, have room for this stuff so I can just say, hey, it is on both sides. Now let's about dorsal root, dorsal root ganglia, and ventral root. Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead first and talk about the dorsal root. Dorsal root, also referred to as the posterior root, is found on the back side. The ventral root, found on the front side, also called the anterior root. 
And the dorsal root has a swelling called the dorsal root ganglion. Now, this is uh, all you have to draw. This is what you got to draw. But, so if you stop here, this is what you guys need to do for your replacement points. What I am going to be doing now is I'm adding a few things I want to talk about. Now, let's go ahead and I'll say, guys, this is what you need to draw. Now, if you put these on that side and label the columns on that side, I'm perfectly fine with that. If you want to put these on both sides and label it all in, in, on both sides bilaterally, that's also fine. Uh, it is not the point. is is just to help you guys put together the anatomy. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to start right here. And I'm going to take a neuron, and I'm going to come out the ventral root, and I'm going to come out and write motor. And then I'm also going to start over here, come out the ventral root, leave, and I'm also going to write motor. Now, the ventral root contains only axons of motor nerves, ventral. Think motor, what does motors do? Motor goes vroom, vroom, vroom. Motor goes vroom. Ventral root holds motor. Motor, vroom, ventral root. Ventral root, vroom. Motor, ventral root. Now, the other ones, let's say I've got sensory. And this sensory information comes in. It's going to travel into the dorsal root. And there's going to be that dorsal root ganglia. And the dorsal root ganglia is going to hold the cell bodies for sensory neurons. And the axons are in the dorsal root. So dorsal roots hold sensory neurons. Whereas ventral roots hold motor neurons. And remember, ventral root, motor, vroom. Okay, vroom, vroom. And I'm going to ask multiple choice questions. Uh, this one will be uh, 30, 20, 30, 20, 30 identifications, 20 multiple choice questions. All right. Um, and that is your cross section through the spinal cord. You guys can see the different por portions there. You can see the, uh, so we started off like you have your, um, uh, we began with the gray matter on the inside, white matter on the outside. We began with the anterior median fissure and the posterior median sulcus. Then we talked about the gray and white commissures. Gray commissures uh, connect uh, both sides here. White commissures connect both sides here. Then we talked about our central canal. Central canal is actually found right here. Now, the central canal is not labeled on this image, but that is the central canal. I do believe it is labeled here. Uh, unfortunately, the image that I had chosen in the book didn't label it there, so I had to use kind of but. Um, the, uh, uh, the anterior, posterior, and lateral gray horns. The anterior gray horn, the lateral gray horn, and the posterior gray horn. It looks like a butterfly. Um, and then we saw our uh, white column, the anterior white column, the lateral white column, and the posterior white column. Then we saw the dorsal root, ventral root, and dorsal root ganglia. The dorsal root, or posterior root, anterior root, or ventral root, and dorsal root ganglia, and here they call it spinal ganglia in our textbooks picture, but our structure sheets still call them dorsal root ganglia. They may have called it spinal ganglia in an update, and um, they update them without telling me, and I have to keep checking this all the time, and yeah, it's annoying, and I can just say it because I, yeah, I know those are extra words for it too. Now, uh, there are differences, and I just wanted to mention that, remember, it's the uh, thoracic and lumbar regions that have lateral gray horns. The rest do not. Um, now, spinal nerves. Spinal nerves, these are what takes my, my spinal cord's tracks. Those are bundles of fibers moving up and down the spinal cord. 
And that takes that information out to go on to other parts of the body, to go on to control muscles and things like that. So our spinal nerve that we have, when we have a spinal nerve, they form what is called, uh, when they combine, they have a ventral and dorsal root. Spinal nerves are produced when a dorsal and ventral root unite. And right here, you have one, is a spinal nerve. And if you don't, you, if you do not label that one, because I did say before that was all you had to do. Now, if you include all, anything extra, it is fine with me. I'm never going to punish you guys for doing too much. It's just when you don't do enough. Now, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and it kind of, you have 31 pairs, uh, two on uh, one on each side, uh, per level. And there's the cervical spinal cord the thoracic spinal cord, lumbar spinal cord, sacral spinal cord, and coccygeal regions of the spinal cord. Now, to remember these, I want you guys to think about your hotline. Uh, it's like a hotline. It's like if you or a loved one been damaged by this, and you may be entitled to compensation, just dial 812-551. Um, for anybody who's in America who uh, has heard that commercial, um, and you need cash now, call J.G. Whitworth, 877-CASH-NOW. And everybody knows that song. And, well, just dial 812-551. You may be entitled to compensation. Uh, 812-551. Okay. Now, uh, as we go through that, 8, 12, 5, 5, 1, 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, 1 coccygeal nerves. Uh, that is uh, one pair of those. So that's 31 total pairs that we have. Now, these pairs, they go out, and after they leave the intervertebral frame of the spinal cord, they're going to branch and form what's called a rami. So a spinal cord, spinal nerve, then branches into rami, a dorsal ramus, a ventral ramus, and the rami communicantes. Now, the dorsal ramus, what this guy does is, is he is going to help give some of the superficial parts of the surface of the back of the skin, your superficial skin, the surface of the skin of the back, and the deep muscles of the back. Uh, is the dorsal rami, so like the very deep, like erector spinae. Where ventral rami, this innervates or supplies neural information to the back muscles, uh, lateral limbs, and the ventral trunk. Superficial back muscles, that would be like your um, latissimus dorsi or trapezius. Then rami communicantes, which there's a gray and a white ramus, these are autonomic nervous system. And they are attached to what's called the, symp uh, the sympathetic trunk ganglia, or sympathetic ganglia and uh, paravertebral ganglia. So when we branch off of our spinal nerve, we get a dorsal ramus, a ventral ramus, and a rami communicantes communicating with a sympathetic chain ganglia, sympathetic trunk ganglia. Now, what we're going to see, guys, is the ventral rami. What happens that's very interesting about ventral rami is this. The ventral rami, those that are associated with all the spinal nerve roots, uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 through T12, etc., 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 there is a C8 nerve root. I will talk about that in a minute. You're like, why in the world is there seven cervical vertebrae but eight cervical nerve roots? I will actually help you understand that. But T2 through T11, they don't go, they go directly to structures. Now, most of the ventral rami, they don't go straight on. Now, T2 through T11, they go straight to the things. They're called thoracic nerves. Intercostal nerves, sorry, apologize, intercostal nerves. The rest of them go on and they join in with other nerves on the sides of them. They branch together and network and form nerve plexuses. So the ones that don't form a plexus is T2 through T11. All the rest 
do form a nerve plexus. And we're going to, here you can actually see that. You can see T2 through T11 go straight between the ribs, forming what we call intercostal nerves. But the rest of them go on and branch together and form nerves that go to like your limbs and stuff. Now, to do this, we're going to start off with our cervical plexus. Now, cervical plexus of nerves. Here is some of the things I'm going to ask you. First off, I'm going to ask you what the ventral rami for each plex. Uh, I could ask you what the ventral rami for the plexus is. So I'm going to ask you what ventral rami. Now, you'll hear me call these roots because they are equivalent terms. Uh, we also call them uh, the ventral rami roots. Uh, if you guys are in lecture, maybe Dr. Malden talks about roots, trunks, divisions, cords, peripheral nerves when he does the lecture. That's when I always say rowdy truckers do coke periodically or reach to drink cold beer. Um, or uh, Randy Travis drinks cold beer. Uh, B for beer stands for branches. And Rowdy Truckers do coke periodically stands for peripheral nerves. And branches and peripheral nerves are equivalent terms. But the roots are the ventral rami. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, peripheral nerves. Now, um, <clears throat> so what I see is we're going to start with C1 through C4. So... Cervical plexus. Let's kind of break these down. And what I'm going to do, since there's four plexuses, I'm just going to do this. Cervical plexus. Now, cervical plexus, what we're going to see, guys, C1 through C4. C1 through C4, then contributions from C C1 through C4 with contributions from C5. C1 through C4 with contributions from C5. Now, what does it control? Well, it controls the muscles of the head, neck, diaphragm, and shoulders. Now, to remember these nerves, I use a mnemonic. If somebody says, hey, I would like, uh, you know, let's say you're a teenage, you're a young kid, you're going to a game store to buy a video game. Your parents said, hey, go buy whatever video game you want, and they even gave them permission to the store, and you're like, man, I want to buy the most violent video game I get, and you're like, so what game would you like? You go, GTA, please, sir. You want to buy Grand Theft Auto, GTA, please, sir. G, T, A, please, sir. Okay, great auricular. Transverse cervical, anza cervicalis. Now, um, uh, then we have phrenic, phrenic, and then supraclavicular nerve. GTA, please, sir, for the cervical plexus. So, what am I going to ask you guys? What nerve roots, what nerves, and what they innervate? Now, I just don't have the things they innervate here. Um, remember, they innervate, they control the muscles of the head, neck, diaphragm, and part of the shoulders. The phrenic is actually the one that controls the diaphragm uh, through using C3, C4, and C5 nerve roots. Uh, I will never forget it because I remember that C3, C4, and C C3, C4, and C5 keep the diaphragm alive. Um... Uh, C5, C6, C7, wings to heaven. <laughs> it's just things like that that I never forget, okay? Um, so, what we're going to see is, guys, uh, those things. Now, next, I want you to be able to identify them. Great auricular. Great auricular. Now, right here, you're going to find the ear. And the great auricular nerve is the one that's crossing around the ear. Great auricular. Now, Great auricular nerve, if you find your mastoid process on the side of your head and you touch it, you may feel a slight kind of nerve tingle. And that is the great auricular. It is a very superficial nerve. Uh, great auricular. I love how they have the hypoglossal nerve here. This hypoglossal nerve comes down and actually feeds into the upper part, the upper root of the ansa cervicalis called the 
uh, descendants hypoglossi. And uh, so it actually does do that. And then what we're going to see, guys, uh, is our transverse cervical. It transverses the neck, transverse cervical. Then our anza cervicalis, anza, is a word that references the handle of a tea kettle. Uh, so anza cervicalis, it is the neck loop. Anza cervicalis. Then the phrenic goes down, down, down to the diaphragm. That's the phrenic nerve, to the diaphragm. C3, C4, and C5 keep the diaphragm alive. And then the supraclavicular, as it does like part of your shoulder, goes over the clavicle here. One, two, three branches. Supraclavicular nerve. One, two, three branches. Supraclavicular nerve coming over the clavicle. GTA, please, sir. And that is all the ones that you have to know. Now, there are some extras on here, but do remember, if it's on, on this list, you're not required to know it. These are the major nerves that we do pick. Uh, and these are the big nerves that are the kind of the major products for these. Uh, they do have branches for those you have to go off for further study. Um, like human anatomy, you'll begin to learn some of these branches like the uh, nerve to omohyoid, the nerve to thyrohyoid, the nerve to genioglossus or something like that. You know, some of these things, like hypoglossals come down and it gives branches off to genioglossus, platoglossus, things like that. You'll have to know those innervations. Now, let's go to brachial plexus. Now, make brachial plexus. Now, there is a way that I remember these, but we're going to start with brachial plexus. Brachial plexus. And the brachial plexus is what supplies the arm. C5 to C8, T1 contributions from C4. C5 through C8. C5 through C8. Then there is T1, but also and contributions from above. Contributions from C4 above. Okay? That means C4 plays a role in the cervical plexus and the brachial plexus, and C5 plays a role in the brachial plexus and the cervical plexus. There is some commingling. Now, how do I remember the nerves? And now we're going to talk about what it controls real quick. It controls the upper limb and shoulder, like your rotator cuff, uh, things like that. Now, the way I remember these is most, alco uh, most alcoholics must really urinate. Most alcoholics must really urinate. Uh, most of my mnemonics throughout college was about alcohol. Surprise, surprise. Uh, college students and beer and things like that. Like reach to drink cold beers or um, things like that. Most alcoholics must really urinate. Median. Axillary. Musculo cutaneous, radial, and ulnar. Now, real quick, I do want to tell a quick story so I remember kind of this goes to most alcoholics must really urinate. I had a student in AMP2, uh, he was in my AMP2 lab, and I'm uh, uh, our first lab back after spring break, he comes in, and I noticed the student's left wrist was just hanging floppy it just was hanging there he was very his, his wrist was very limp and um so i kind of immediately thought well you know i bet he had a good time over spring break so i asked him he's like how do you know it's like uh, you got the old saturday night palsy and what he had done was he had gotten drunk and passed out in a lawn chair over spring break, and compressed his radial nerve, which uh, which actually temporarily paralyzed his extensors of his forearm. So his wrist just hung, hung there. He had wrist drop. We call it Saturday night palsy because when you pass out and compress the radial nerve at the elbow, you can no longer innovate the extensors, so you have wrist drop. We call it, lovingly call it Saturday Night Palsy. 
And uh, that's exactly what happened. So I got a good laugh out of that. That was some radial nerve palsy. So most alcoholics must really urinate. Um, so we said C5 to C8, T1, contributions in C4. Controls your upper limbs and shoulder. Most alcoholics must really urinate. You could say most alcoholics must really urinate. You could say musculocutaneous, axillary, most alcoholics must uh, median, uh, really radial urinate ulnar, but I just have median first. Median nerve is a uh, median nerve injury, sometimes called uh, carpal tunnel. Um, ulnar nerve, that's your funny bone. Uh, axillary nerve injuries uh, can mess up your rotator cuff and not able to do that. Uh, long thoracic also is a nerve that's somehow related here. Uh, you can actually see parts of the long thoracic here. Uh, as we said, C5, C6, C7, wings to heaven. Uh, so what you guys will notice with that is, now this, I just want to use this diagram for one thing. I want to help you guys find this M. Find the M. The M is going to help you learn one, two, three nerves very easily. M, M, U. Mama, you. Mama, you. Mwah. 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 M. Musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar. So this is very important that you guys find the anatomical M. Here's the diagram I use for the test. <clears throat> and I had to go and label axillary nerve because our book didn't do it is uh, let's use my mnemonic, most alcoholics must really urinate. And let's say median is what I started off with on my list, because I have it written down. Median nerve comes out uh, right here. You can see it's from the middle of the M, middle of the M, travels all the way down here. Median nerve. Axillary nerve is right here. It actually comes here from what's called the posterior cord, and then comes out and wraps around here, helps control muscles of the rotator cuff. Most alcoholics musk, musculocutaneous. Musculocutaneous nerve, this nerve here, controls our, um, uh, this nerve right here, starting here on the most lateral side of our M, travels down, down, down here. This is what controls biceps and things like that, brachialis. Coracobrachialis. Then we didn't learn coracobrachialis. Um, most alcoholics must really radial. Uh, radial nerve is right here. Radial nerve coming down. Radial nerve palsy causes law, uh, law, inability to extend. And then urinate ulnar. Ulnar nerve comes at the bottom of the anatomical M. One, two, three. Ulnar. Down here, up around the medial epicondyle, up and under, and here is why when you bang your elbow, you feel it down here in your pinky. Most alcoholics must really urinate. Uh, and I just wanted to show this because you can actually see, like, uh, ulnar nerve pinky, and that's why you'll feel it. And this is where they test. Uh, and I was just showing. Uh, you will not be tested on these. I, I don't know why. I let, uh, um, It's actually something I'm in the point of with accessibility is basically removing unnecessary items. And I always used to like to add clinically relevant things because most of my students want to go into healthcare. And um, I always like to teach that. Now, we're going to end with our, ladder, uh, our lumbar plexus and sacral plexus combined together with lumbosacral. But lumbar plexus... Uh, T12, L4, T12 to L4, lumbar plexus, lumbar plexus. Now, lumbar plexus, lumbar plexus, remember I said it was T12 to L4, T12 to L4 vertebral level. Now, the way to remember these nerves is fig oil. It seems like they're making oil out of everything now. It's like milk. Can we agree that we have enough milks? Uh, oat milk, flaxseed milk, um, uh, cashew milk, um, soy milk, everything else. Well, we have all kinds of oils. Now we have fig oil. And it's the new oil that everybody's going to be saying we need to eat. Fig oil. Now, fig oil... Uh, is going to be the femoral, 
uh, the iliohypogastric. The genito femoral, the obturator nerve, the ilio inguinal, and then lastly we have the lateral femoral cutaneous. Mere fig oil. That'll help you remember all the nerves of the lumbar plexus, the fig oil. And um, this controls your abdominal wall, the external genitalia, and even your lower limbs, like the thighs. So femoral, iliohypogastric, genofemoral, lateral femoral cutaneous, ilioguinal, and obturator. Now fig oil, F I G O I L. So I did there and then there to make fig oil. Now sacral plexus. Um, the only one I've got is when somebody says, well, what are you going to fight me with? You like these, this fist pop, pop. <laughs> that's, that's the only one I got. I don't have a good one there. Uh, the rest of them I got really good ones, I think, but that's the one that needs the most work. Uh, my, my, my favorite is most alcoholics must really urinate. Um, we're going to see it's L4, L5, S1, S4, L4, L5, S1, S4, uh, sacral plexus. L4, what? L4, L5, S1, S4. L4, L5, S1, S4. L4, L5, S1, S4. Now, fist, pop, pop. That's how you're going to fight. You're going to fight with this fist, pop, pop. You just got to... Double that ass out, fist, pop, pop. So, uh, what is fist, pop, pop? Sorry, uh, this is um, fibular nerve. Yeah, I was about to, I, was, I think, I, well, I was writing it right, and then I thought it was fibular nerve, or common fibular. Uh, now, we have, um, on ours, we talk about the, there's two gluteals, the inferior gluteal and the superior gluteal the sciatic now as we talk about the tibial pudendal and posterior femoral cutaneous we have lateral so the tibial nerve Posterior femoral cutaneous and the uh, pudendal. Pudendal. Okay. So that's going to help you learn what nerves make it up. Now, the lumbar and sacral plexuses, what do they do? They combine together, they go down into the legs, and they make your leg nerves. So let's start in order with my mnemonics, and I'll travel through lumbar plexus and sacral plexus together in my mnemonics. So let's start off with lumbar plexus. Let's find femoral. Oops. Femoral nerve, as you're going to see here, femoral nerve here, femoral. Now, with femoral, there's the iliohypogastric nerve, uh, and the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal. Uh, to find these together, iliohypogastric is on the outside, where closer to the stomach would be. Ilioinguinal is on the other side, closer to where the groin would be. So we'll come back to the ilioinguinal. The genitofemoral nerve, as you can see labeled here and cut off here, uh, genitofemoral. Obturator nerve associated here, passing and associated to the obturator foramen. And you'll see him kind of pass down. And obturator nerve, I thought, and I uh, noticed that obturator nerve, as he comes down here, you will should see part of him come out. 
here to the operator frame it. Now, ilio inguinal, as I said, is going to be of this branch here closer to the groin, where ilio hypogastric, the outer branch closer to the stomach. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve associated here, coming down, boop, on the lateral side of the femur, lateral femoral cutaneous. Now let's turn our attention to sacral plexus, Fem uh, the fibular nerve. Fibular nerve, also called the um, uh, common fibular, uh, the common fibular nerve here on the side of the head of the fibula. Then it branches into two, a superficial and deep fibular nerve, but right here is the fibular nerve. And also common fibular here as well before it branches right here, common fibular. Uh, now the inferior and superior gluteals. The inferior gluteal and the superior gluteal nerve seen here. Now the tibial nerve, of course, going to be best be seen here after the branch tibial nerve. Uh, you won't see it very well here. You're going to see it very well here. Pudendal is usually best seen here. Pudendal. But also can see a little bit of it right there. But I like to tag it pudendal if I tag it here. And pudendal is going to be closest to the buttocks area, closest to here, you're where your booty is. So we think it smells there. Pudendal. Pudendal. Okay. <laughs> I know, but it works. The posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, seen here between the sciatic nerve and the pudendal, is posterior femoral cutaneous. Uh, the sciatic is the only one I left off. I didn't take it. It's the big nerve here that goes all the way down. It's the largest one here, the sciatic. Best seen here. Compression of sciatic nerve, of course, does cause the leg to go to sleep. Sciatica can be caused by uh, like L4, L5 compressions. Maybe you have uh, in the hip, there's a, a muscle that goes across uh, part of this in the hip. It goes across it. It's called the... Um, um, uh, I knew I would, uh, uh, piriformis, there we go. My brain just couldn't get that to pop out. <clears throat> okay. Guys, that is it for today's lab. Uh, all diagrams from this section, so uh, the diagrams used in, this, in these notes that I pointed to will be used for our examination. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Um, and if you do need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. But thank you. I've appreciated everything, all your hard work and effort this semester. You guys have done great. Just keep at it. I'm proud of you. And you could do this. We're in the home stretch now, guys. We are in the last four weeks of this semester. Uh, we have this. This week, next week, and then an exam, and then lecture finals. We're in four weeks, three chapters. I'm going to finish it strong. It, it, it feels good. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much, and I really wish I could see you before the end of the semester. But guys, take care, be safe, be healthy, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Thank you.